so today we have uh, a re, uh, like a renal replacement therapy in critical care so we will be having uh, two modules to today we'll be having that uh, the basic module and to talk on this thing we have uh, the best person uh, he is uh, dr josh chako uh, my teacher uh, and again you all might have read his uh, review paper in indian journal of critical care medicine uh, i think almost 8 uh, 10 years back itself so from that point onwards he is like a master in uh, renal replacement therapy and uh, not only the uh, continuous renal replacement therapy and all these hybrid therapies like slide down other modes of uh, therapies as well so i think uh, you are all lucky to hear uh, uh, like the renal replacement therapy basics and how to prescribe and all other uh, uh, like uh, his experience also uh, in this lecture so over uh, over to sir thank you very much anu for those kind words i hope you are able to see my screen yes sir is absolutely fine okay so let's start so on this topic of renal replacement therapy we are doing the first module is that right yes sir it will be on continuous renal replacement therapies we come across patients like this every other day in our hospital they are in end stage renal disease they have a fistula and they come for dialysis once in two or three days otherwise they are fairly healthy without any organ dysfunction maybe they may have some degree of cardiac failure especially the older patients but generally speaking they are fairly okay in terms of functioning of other organs it's just a renal failure and they get dialyzed once in a couple of days we clean their blood over a period of 3 or 4 hours and we take out the vo volume from their body which has been accumulating over the last several days because many of them won't have any urine output either so essentially you clean up the blood and you remove fluid over 3 days or so per week among these patients and they withstand it quite well we dialyze them over a period of 3 or 4 hours we clear the solute and we take off volume and they do well so this is perfectly fine for patients who are in end stage renal disease but if you do the same for your intensive care patients or critically ill in multi organ failure if you try to do the same thing by dialyzing them once every 2 or 3 days clear their solutes over a period or a short period of 3 or 4 hours time and if you take off the volume that is accumulated over time in that very brief period of time severe problems may arise especially in patients with circulatory failure they drop their blood pressures you will find that you need to increase their vasopressors quite significantly solute clearance becomes very rapid osmolality reduces very rapidly and what you get essentially is a roller coaster ride like this so you start dialysis you dialyze for a few hours you clean up the solutes the osmolality reduces electrolytes come down will you take a volume as well but then what happens is during the period that you're not doing any dialysis everything bounces back with increase in solute level increase in the volume increase in the acid level and this goes on and on and on which is not very good for your organ functioning particularly for the functioning of the kidneys if there is any residual function left in fact there are several studies that have shown that if you do intermittent hemodialysis in hemodynamically unstable patients who are in multi organ failure in the icu the chance of their of their recovery over the long run becomes smaller and whatever little function they may have may also be lost during this roller coaster ride so this is precisely the reason why we have other softer softer gentler modalities of renal replacement therapy specifically tailored to intensive care patients so to smoothen things out you need to look at other methods of renal replacement 
several years ago, we used to do continuous renal replacement with machines like this. These machines were just simple roller pumps and many of them had just one pump for to pump out the blood from the body. And we used to use separate infusion pumps to deliver the replacement solution and also to take out volume from the patient. But things have evolved since then. Today we have these modern machines with several pumps and they are pretty much automated. The circuitry is very much easy, user friendly and things have really become, life has become easy for patients as well as for caregivers with these newer modalities and newer machines that we have at our disposal. Essentially, when you do renal replacement, you make yourself a filter like you see on the screen. And what do you do? You pass blood through this filter and this filter essentially come, consists of hollow fibers through which the blood passes. The blood passes through these hollow fibers and it comes out through the other side. And then you have the filtrate, which is water plus electrolytes plus the solutes of renal failure, including urea. These molecules come out. So if you look at it a little more closely, this is the filter and you have the hollow fibers through which blood passes and you get the filtrate from a different port. And you can run a dialysate, which is colored yellow in this picture to, to, to perform diffusive clearance, which we'll come to a little later on. So that is essentially the basic principle of filtration in patients with renal failure. Now let us look at the mechanism, the mechanisms of clearance during renal replacement therapy. How do solute molecules get cleared? What are the mechanisms by which we get rid of these solute molecules? One of the methods is, as you see now, you pass blood through one side of the filter and as you pass blood into this filter, obviously the hydrostatic pressure in the filter will rise. And as the hydrostatic pressure rises, it leaks out water and along with the water, solutes also come out through the pores in the filter. So in other words, as water comes out, it drags the solid molecules or the solutes along with it. This is otherwise called solvent drag because the solvent, which is water in this case, drags out the solute molecules, which includes the molecules of renal failure as well along with it. So that is solvent drag or hemofiltration. And this process is called convective clearance. So convective clearance is wherein water comes out purely because of hydrostatic pressure. It leaks out through the holes and along with the water, solute molecules also come out. There are two things that decide how much solute comes out. First, as I mentioned, is the hydrostatic pressure. The higher the hydrostatic pressure, the higher will be the number of molecules that come out first. And secondly, obviously, it has to depend on the pore size. If the solute molecules are smaller in size than the holes, they will come out, obviously. But if the solute molecules are larger than the pores, they will not come out. So essentially what you do is very similar to what normally happens at the glomerular level in terms of glomerular filtration. Water comes out, electrolytes come out, solute molecules also come out. But this membrane, like the membrane at the glomerular level, is impermeable to plasma proteins as well as the formed elements of the blood. So proteins don't leak out, blood cells don't leak out. Water does, electrolytes do, and the solutes of renal failure, including urea, also come out. And as I mentioned, it is very analogous to the normal filtration at the glomerular level. Now, what is the second mechanism? So we have gone through convective clearance or solvent drag, wherein water drags the solid molecules along with it, purely based on hydrostatic pressure. And 
depending on the pore size of the membrane. The second mechanism is when you add dialysate. So the principle of dialysis is based on diffusion, wherein, again, blood passes through the filter, as you can see. Blood passes through the filter, as you can see. And when it passes through, you run the dialysate generally in the opposite direction. And as you see here, the dialysate solution is a clean solution. It doesn't have any solutes apart from water and electrolytes. There is no urea in the dialysate, obviously. So molecules of renal failure, they traverse from the blood across to the dialysate through a concentration gradient, purely because the concentration of the solutes is higher in the blood and lower in the dialysate, these molecules diffuse out from the blood into the dialysate, purely based on the concentration gradient, the, from a higher concentration to a lower concentration. So that is the principle of diffusion. And clearance happens when you add dialysate, clearance happens through diffusion. That's called diffusive clearance. So for diffusive clearance, you need to add a dialysate and you need to have a concentration gradient and the solutes travel across a concentration gradient from a higher concentration level to a lower concentration level. So these are essentially the two methods of clearance in renal replacement therapy. First, as I mentioned, is hemofiltration, which is convective clearance, or solvent drag, as it is called, which is purely based on the hydrostatic pressure and the pore size. And the second method, if you use a dialysate, is through diffusion, wherein the solid molecules go across the filter and get excreted out purely based on the principle of diffusion from a region of higher concentration to an area of a lower concentration. Now let us look at it just briefly one more time as to what really happens in practice. That's the filter. You deliver blood through the inline and as it goes through because of the hydrostatic pressure, you get the hemofiltrate or the ultrafiltrate. And then the blood comes out through the other side and you return it to the patient. So this mechanism is purely based on convective clearance or it is otherwise called hemofiltration. So that is hemofiltration and, and the, the next mechanism, as I mentioned, when you do hemofiltration, the hemofiltrate comes out like this. And the volume of filtrate that you remove is in your control. You can set the volume that you remove. And depending on the type of therapy that you use, which we will discuss later on, you can choose the volume that you remove. You may remove, say, one liter or 1.5 liters. Now, when you remove so much of fluid, obviously, you need to replace the volume lost. Otherwise, the patient will end up with severe hypovolemia. So you will need to replace the fluid. Whatever comes out needs to be replaced with a clean solution. This solution is obviously dirty. It contains the molecules of renal failure, including urea, and you replace it with a clean solution. So that is called the replacement fluid. So this whole mechanism is hemofiltration. Blood goes in, it filters out. The volume that you filter out, in, filter out is in your control and the replacement is also in your control. If you, if you take out, if the hemofiltration is, the ultrafiltrate is say one liter per hour, which is what you set. And if you want your patient to be negative by 100 mils, it's a simple thing. You replace 900 mils. So that will be a negative for the system of minus 100 mils. Of course, the gross overall negative balance depends on how much you give your patient in terms of IV fluids, infusions, feeds, et cetera, and so on. And if there is any urine output, you'll have to add it to the negative balance as well. But for this system, if you take out one liter and if you replace with 900 mils, the, net, the balance here is minus 100 mils. So that is... Uh, 
purely this whole mechanism without dialysis it is purely ultrafiltration there is no dialysate here it is called continuous veno venous hemofiltration there is no dialysis there is no diffusive clearance all of the clearance is by convective clearance or hemofiltration and because you replace with a clean solution the solutes will get diluted and that effectively cleans the plasma of all the electrolytes and solutes so that is veno venous hemofiltration and the replacement fluid that you use as i mentioned the clean solution that you use is something like this which contains similar electrolyte composition as the plasma sodium in this case is 140 potassium of course you don't really give a lot of potassium on this bag as you can see the potassium level is two millimoles per liter you can have a potassium free bag as well and then you have calcium magnesium chloride and very important to replace bicarbonate because most of the bicarbonate will come out through the ultrafiltrate so the bicarbonate needs to be replaced and usually you use a bicarbonate concentration of 35 millimoles per liter now this replacement bag is or similar bags are what we use currently several companies make it in fact you get bags with a separate bicarbonate pouch you can break open and mix at the time of the therapy which is uh, what most of the hospitals use these days but previously we used lactate instead of bicarbonate because of the ease of preparing the lactated solution it doesn't have to come in a separate pouch it came in the same bag and you can deliver it as lactate if the liver is functioning okay each millimole of lactate will get converted to one millimole of bicarbonate in the liver so if the liver functions okay the replacement solution can be a lactated solution which will contain instead of bicarbonate it'll contain 35 millimoles of lactate per liter but of course, the liver function may be impaired with many of your ICU patients and lactated solutions are not that easy to get. It was cheaper, much cheaper those days. I don't know if it's available freely now. What we've been using is a bicarbonated solution as replacement. So that is, in summary, hemofiltration with replacement fluid, which is pink color coded on the screen here. And the next question is, where exactly at what location do you replace or you do you administer the replacement fluid now that is the filter and you can administer the replacement fluid before the filter or pre-filter or you can deliver it post filter what is a big deal why do you want to think about this complexity there is a reason if you give it pre-filter there is a major advantage in that the blood within the filter will get diluted. That's a good thing. That can be a good thing because if you keep the filter continuously flushed with this replacement solution, it thins out the blood and reduces the incidence of filter clotting. So your filter will have a longer life and the anticoagulation that you may need to use may be less if you give the replacement fluid pre-filter. Is there any problem with giving the fluid pre-filter? The problem with giving it pre-filter is that the clearance becomes less because you're diluting the blood and the solutes get diluted. And because the solutes get diluted, the clearance will also be lower. The second option, as I mentioned, is to, is to deliver the replacement fluid post-filter. If you deliver it post-filter, clearance will be better, but you won't have the advantage of of reducing the viscosity of the blood within the filter and prolonging filter life. So you need to choose previously, and even these days, what we normally do is to deliver pre-filter as much as possible because delivering it pre-filter prolongs the life of the filter. And the filter and the system is very costly business, as you all know. It'll come to around 20, 25,000 rupees per day just to replace this whole kit. 
And if it breaks down, not only is it costly, it interrupts therapy. The most important factor that makes CRRT efficient is the continuity of the process. If you interrupt it, even for a short while, the effective delivery comes down and that reduces the efficiency of therapy. That's the reason why you would like to keep the filter patent as long as possible and deliver it as long as possible and prevent interruptions due to blockage. And once it gets blocked, to set it up again is not easy in many units. You need to call the technician in and they, they will take their time. You need to set up the whole system and it takes time, obviously. So pre-filter is generally preferred, but it depends on your circumstances. Okay, so that is hemofiltration and replacement. Now, what is continuous venovenous dialysis or CVVD? In this instance, as you can see, blood passes into the filter. You have the ultrafiltrate, but the predominant method of clearance here is through diffusion. You administer a dialysate fluid, color-coded yellow on this image. You run it in an opposite direction. This is to enhance clearance. It's called countercurrent infusion of dialysate. And this dialysate will go in through like this. Blood will come in like in the opposite direction and you have diffusion across the fibers and diffusive clearance happens. So this clearance is purely diffusive across the concentration gradient. There is no filtration here. And so that is continuous veno-venous dialysis, clearance being entirely diffusive. So what we have seen so far, initially we saw pure veno-venous hemofiltration without dialysate. What you're seeing here in this image, we are not replacing. We are just delivering dialysate. That's continuous venovenous dialysis. What we use in practice in many units is a combination of these two to ensure that you have some degree of convective and some degree of diffusive clearance as well. Why do you combine these two therapies? Would it be okay if you just do CVVH or continuous venovenous hemofiltration instead of adding dialysate? Well, the answer to that is you can do. Clearance may not change very much in terms of the important molecules like urea. It may not differ very much. What really matters is the volume that you use, which we will discuss a little later on. The, the technique of therapy may not matter, but it does matter in one particular regard. It does matter in the type of molecules that are clear. If you use a predominantly convective clearance or CVVH, or hemofiltration, it will clear large and middle-sized molecules. As you know, in sepsis, the cytokines that you get in abundance are middle-sized molecules, which are very well cleared by hemofiltration. When you do diffusive clearance, it clears the small molecules. It does not clear middle or high sized molecules very well. So in aseptic patients, if you are aiming for cytokine clearance, it may be worthwhile doing hemofiltration rather than dialysis because dialysis or diffusive clearance does not clear the middle size and smaller molecules. So that's one of the advantages. Having said that, there is no definitive evidence that clearing of cytokines helps in patients with sepsis. People have tried CVVH, high volume hemofiltration using up to 40 mils per kilogram or more, but uh, none of these therapies have actually proven to improve clinical outcomes. But as I mentioned, in theory, if you need to clear the cytokines, you use a predominantly convective modality of therapy. So that is pure convective and pure dialysate. As I mentioned, you normally combine both these. As you can see on this image, you are using a replacement fluid, which means there is convective clearance, part convective, and you're using a dialysate as well, which is the green color-coded fluid here. So pink is the replacement fluid. The green is the dialysate fluid. So you are combining both. And you can split this in a convenient manner depending on the total dosage that you use. Total dosage, we will come to a little later on as well, but generally speaking, the total dosage that you use is roughly the current recommended guidelines is about 25 mils per hour. 25 mils per hour in an adult person will range between 1.5 to 2 liters of total dose. You can deliver it as 
convective or dialysis or diffusive clearance by dialysis safe. So if you're combining both, you might use, if you're, if you're using a total volume of two liters, you can use a 1.5 as, as replacement or convective clearance and 500 mils as dialysis safe or vice versa, depending on the circumstances. So as I mentioned, generally you use a combination of both these modalities. So what is the big deal with continuous renal replacement therapies compared to intermittent modalities of treatment, including hemodialysis? Why do we take so much of pain, so much of time, incur so much of cost as well to try to do continuous therapies in many of our patients? Like we mentioned at the beginning, the use of intermittent modalities of therapy are associated with hemodynamic perturbances, which can be severely damaging, not only to the kidney, but to the other organs as well. In case of the kidney, at least it's been clearly shown, as I mentioned previously, the extent of recovery of renal function may be poor if you use continuous therapies in your hemodynamically unstable patients. And the roller coaster blood pressures that you see with continuous therapies will also lead to damage to other organs, multi-organ failure as well. So that's the reason why, one of the main reasons why you would use continuous therapies. The second reason as to why you may use continuous therapies is, you know, when you remove fluid, if you use an intermittent modality, and suppose you do hemodialysis once in two days, the fluid that you give the, to the patient in terms of the resuscitation fluid, in terms of the feeds that you use, the infusions, that the several infusion, drug infusions that you use, they all accumulate over time. And they really fill up over the, over the period of 24 or 48 hours. And then you do dialysis. You take everything out within a matter of four hours or, or, or six hours. And this can cause not only hemodynamic instability, it can acutely reduce the osmolality of the blood, which further causes problems in terms of not only hypotension, particularly in patients with possible brain injury, like you say traumatic brain injury or stroke or hepatic encephalopathy. Among these patients, if you dramatically reduce the osmolality with hemodialysis over a short period of time, what will happen if you reduce osmolality? You increase the brain edema. The brain swells up and that can actually, I have seen at least a couple of patients in my time in whom you did hemodialysis. These patients were on, on hem regular hemodialysis and stage renal disease. And they came in with stroke. One of them came in with hepatic encephalopathy. And once we, once we did hemodialysis, they actually, their brains swelled up and and both of them corned and died so that's how serious it can be it's not very common but that's something you need to be very aware of when you do hemodialysis intermittently in patients with cerebral edema third as i mentioned there is a potential for clearing inflammatory mediators which has been used as one of the modalities of therapy with especially high volume hemofiltration, but the efficacy of this, it certainly clears the cytokines, but the question to ask is, does clearing cytokines improve clinical outcomes? And from all we know so far, in terms of the clinical evidence that has gathered over time, there is nothing to suggest that the use of continuous therapies, high volume hemofiltration and cytokine removal does not result in improved survival or even reduced time on ventilation, uh, improved oxygen parameters, etc. Now, how do you set up a CRRT machine for therapy? I will just briefly go through, just stick to the basic, simple, simple stupid rules. The first thing is to set the blood flow. And the blood flow here that you set, you begin with a, a slow blood flow rate, usually about 150 to 200 mils per minute. And you crank it up, maybe up to 300 or more, depending on the patient's hemodynamic stability. So you set the blood flow and you need to choose the therapy. As I mentioned, there are three modalities you can use. It's 
either hemofiltration or hemodialysis or diafiltration. Normally you use a combination of hemofiltration and dialysis called hemodiafiltration. The dose of therapy, like I mentioned, several studies have been done in the past as to what is the optimal dosing. A dose of 25 mils per kilogram is roughly what the guidelines suggest. Even if you set 25 mils per kilogram, which will work out to roughly 1.5 to 2 liters per hour in an average adult patient, you must allow downtime due to filter blockage and so on. And even if you set at 25, the actual dose that you deliver may be much lower than that. So, so you must aim for at least 25, which is roughly 2 liters in the adult. And you must decide as to how much fluid you want to be removed. How much fluid you want to be removed from the body. You start generally with an even balance. You don't try to take out fluid because taking out fluid may cause hypotension, particularly in patients who are on a high dose of vasopressors. But depending on how you go, you start with as low as 50 mils per hour out. As I mentioned, if you use a dose of two liters, in you, your ultrafiltrate should be set at 1,900 mils for a negative balance of 100. So you start with zero, increase to 50, 100, and you can go to as high as you wish, maybe 300, 400 mils per uh, hour or even more. So this is like you're simulating the normal renal function of a fixed volume of fluid per hour removed instead of taking off say three liters over a period of four hours, which can cause your patient severe hemodynamic instability and cause a severe crash. Anticoagulation is one of the other important factors to consider. Most of the patients require some degree of anticoagulation to keep the circuit patent. If you don't use any anticoagulation, you can do heparin free as well, even in CRRT. But if you use no anticoagulation, there is a high likelihood of filter clotting, interruption of therapy, and it adds to the cost. Each time it clots, you need to get a new kit and it adds to the cost as well. So heparin was very commonly used previously. You need to use a bolus dose depending on the coagulation parameters of your patient. Roughly you use a bolus dose of 2,500 to 5,000 units and then you run about 500 to 1,000 units per hour depending on the APTT of your patient and the, the platelet count of your patient and you measure APTT at regular intervals as well to keep it within range. So that is one of the options. The other options, one of the other options that we use these days is to use a citrated solution, which has a, a, a much lower incidence of causing bleeding uh, as is the case with heparin because you antagonize it with calcium. So there's a, a topical uh, anticoagulation, the filter alone without causing the patient a coagulopathy, which may cause bleeding. So that these are the options that you use for anticoagulation. And you can also use prostacycline, um, which is also, which was also used previously. But these days, people tend to use a citrated solution more commonly. Of course, it is more costlier. So you need to consider that as well. So to summarize, Continuous renal replacement therapies are the ideal treatment or the most preferred treatment in patients with multi-organ failure in ICU who may be hemodynamically unstable and on multiple vasopressors. You essentially do a soft, gentle dialysis in a continuous manner instead of doing intermittently every two days or three days, take off a huge volume out, clean up the blood in one go, reduce osmolality, drastically, which can all cause severe problems. The mechanisms of clearance in CRRT are convective clearance or solvent drag, which is the principle behind hemofiltration, or diffusive clearance, which is a principle that we use in dialysis. In practice, you generally use a combination of both these methods. The other advantages of, of using CRRT include preservation of osmolality, reduction in catastrophic cerebral complications, including worsening of cerebral edema, preservation of organ function. And also studies have shown that the incidence of renal or the, the, the possibility of renal recovery or reversibility of renal function is better with continuous therapies than intermittent therapies. The dose 
roughly is 25 mils per kilogram per hour, which is two liters in your average adult patient. Anticoagulation may be with heparin or with a citrative solution. And you generally tend to run the circuit for as long as you can, 40 to 72 hours. Generally, after 72 hours or so, if you have done 72 hours, that's good, you've done very well. But if you do more than 72 hours, the efficiency, of course, comes down. But generally speaking, you can continue with the same filter for a, a prolonged period of time. And in our circumstances, of course, cost is an important factor. Running CRRT is uh, costly, but you should not consider mainly from the point of view of the cost that you use for this particular modality of therapy. It is the cost effectiveness in terms of the outcomes of your patient. And although evidence has not really shown that CRRT improves clinical outcomes in a major way, most of the comparisons have not included the sickest among the sick of patients in whom CRRT is the most effective modality of treatment. So it's a comparison that you really cannot do on on a, on a practical level. So I think I will wind up here. We can carry on with the discussion at this time. Uh, sir, uh, uh, to start the discussion, uh, like usually, uh, like uh, when you were working in UK or Australia, our ICU... I cannot hear you, cannot... Anup, is your mic on? Uh, yes, sir. I cannot hear me. Can you hear me, sir? Hello? Hello? Sorry. Hello? Yeah. You can't hear me? Yeah, I can hear. So, sir, can you hear me? Mm. I'm unable to hear. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Uh, I think uh, your audio has some problem. Maybe the speaker volume you can raise, sir. Your speaker volume, can you just check, sir? Or you can just uh, disconnect the like uh, earphone and use the system mic, I think. System uh, speaker. Not able to hear you. Sanish? Yeah. Uh, can you hear uh, Dr. Sanish? Yeah, yeah, I can hear. No. Yeah. I'm asking Joe, sir, whether he can hear uh, what Dr. Sanish yeah. is speaking. So, uh, can you hear me, sir? Joe, sir? Sanish or somebody else, can you speak? Yeah. I don't know. If yeah. I... Uh, can you hear me, sir? I am unable to hear you. There is some problem here. Yeah. Maybe you can um, uh, switch on. Shall the... I leave and rejoin? That may help. Yes, sir. I think uh, that will be better, sir. I will just leave and leave the meeting and rejoin. Okay. Uh, Sunny sir, can you just uh, uh, stop his slide sharing? One minute. One minute. Okay. Uh, so now, just one minute. I just uh, see on this. Sorry for the interruption. We'll uh, sort out the technical issues now. Dr. Jose Chaco is again rejoining. So, uh, can you hear us now, sir? Hello? Hello? Sunny, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear. Yeah, I can hear. Can you just show up the share? I was just uh, trying the uh, simulator just to show them one presentation. Sir, Joe, sir, can yes, you uh, hear us, sir? So, yeah, my mic is my okay. Okay, yeah, yeah. How about that? Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, okay. fine, sir. Yeah. All right.
Yeah. Sorry about that. So, uh, like, uh, can you just tell them, sir, like uh, how to prescribe usually when we prescribe a CRRT? Like, what are the things we are going to prescribe, and the difference between because majority of the unit uh, now they are because of the cost issue they are uh, shifting on to uh, sled or uh, hemodialysis. So, like, and even when the patient is hemodynamically unstable, majority of the time uh, uh, we go with the sled. So, majority of our uh, uh, trainees don't know how to prescribe CRRT. So, in terms of blood flow, dialysate flow, and uh, again the replacement, uh, the usually how to prescribe. Yes, yes, Sanu. So, first, as I mentioned, is to determine what modality of treatment would you want. The modality of treatment is uh, maybe continuous venovenous hemofiltration or hemodiafiltration. filtration. These are the common modalities that you use. Generally speaking, most units use dia filtration, veno venous hemodiafiltration. filtration. And when you when you do dia filtration, when you choose the modality as dia filtration, you need to choose first the dose that you're going to use. As I mentioned, the dose is roughly 25 mils per kilogram per hour. 25 mils per kilogram per hour will work out to roughly two liters per hour. And if you're using hemodiafiltration, you need to split it up between dialysate and replacement. So suppose you're using two liters of total flow, you can make it say 1.5 liters of filtration or replacement, 1.5 liters and 500 mils of dialysate, which is roughly, which is roughly what most people do. You split it up between filtration, between replacement and dialysate, 1.5 to 500 mils. And then you get the circuit up and running, you have the catheter in, you connect the circuit, you've chosen the modality that you wish to, and you start with a very low blood flow. The lowest blood flow that you can go down to in most machines is 100 to 150 ml per minute. So you use that flow to begin with, and you look at the blood pressures. At that time, don't, don't choose any fluid removal. Set the fluid removal at zero, which essentially means you're not taking out any fluid. You are replacing whatever you are taking out. So start at a low flow, 50 to 100 mils per minute, and set the fluid removal to zero, and then see how it goes. Wait for 10 minutes, 15 minutes. If your patient holds on, you increase the, wind up the blood flow to 200 mils per minute. 150 or 200 mils per minute. And you start fluid removal at 50 mils per hour, 100 mils per hour. So this is done in a stepwise manner every few minutes. Increase the blood flow. Maximal blood flow is about 300, 400 mils per minute. You don't go higher than that normally. And you increase the fluid removal in, st in stages as well. 50, 100, 200, or even more. 300 or more, depending on the circumstances, depending on how much fluid you want to take out from the patient and the hemodynamic stability in your patient. So once you get a feel of how your patient behaves, you, in a stepwise manner, increase the blood flow and increase the fluid removal rate. Anticoagulation, as I mentioned, is another important aspect. In a patient who has normal coagulation parameters without any rise in the APTT, INR, and with normal platelet counts, you normally give a bolus dose of heparin of 5,000 units. And the technicians, obviously, they will use a heparinized flush for the circuit as well. So 5,000 bolus, and then you give roughly 500 to 1,000 units per hour in a patient who has got normal coagulation parameters. If the patient does not have, if the patient has a coagulopathy, obviously you need to titrate the dose of heparin or not use heparin at all. You may use a citrated solution. So these are the simplistic steps in carrying out CRRT by the bedside. Sir, uh, like uh, one another doubt, like uh, especially uh, like uh, like you've already worked in uh, UK, Australia, etc. So those units, all the nurses are uh, well versed in doing uh, doing CRRT. 
that is why like whenever uh, uh, you want a hemodialysis or sled you have to take the help of a dialysis uh, uh, this a dialysis technician or the nephrologist but in india we have the opposite situation like even our icu nurses are trained in uh, doing the sled but uh, they are not able to perform a crrt so how can we change that practice sir what is your advice on that it depends on training and for training of course you need to use this modality more often if you use it once in a while given the rapid turnover of our nurses they won't have enough time to get used to it and that's a problem that i see everywhere having said that many of our nurses are able to do sled on their own uh, that's fine with occasional support from the re- the the technician team from the nephrology department but otherwise it all comes with training if you you use this modality often and if you select nurses who are interested to do this as well and if you give them enough training to do it it is very easy to do it by the bedside and once once you train a few nurses they can train their peers as well and this uh, will of course involve the whole nursing team over a period of time and it, it needs to be integrated into our into our practice um one of the problems obviously will be uh turf battles and uh, so on with the nephrology unit and so on because a lot of it may depend on the income generated by the uh, icu team and nephrology team as well so that should not be a concern at all i feel you should work in the best interest of the patient really and and if you have a skilled nursing team who can do this that's the best way to do it because otherwise in a setting where you need to call the technician all the time you end up spending so much of time organizing the the system getting the technician in and if there is an interruption to therapy you again need to call the technician they have to set it up all this takes a, a longer period of time which can all be achieved by adequate adequately trained nursing staff by the bedside it is something that can be done uh, and i think if you put your heart and mind into it it can be done over a period of time so there are many uh, questions about sled uh, like uh, how to prescribe and again the main difference between hemodialysis and sled and comparing with crrt okay so in sled it is a modified form of hemodialysis obviously it is just a modification of hemodialysis the clearance is entirely diffusive clearance there is no convective clearance with sled as in normal intermittent hemodialysis the clearance is entirely by diffusion so there is no clearance obviously of the middle molecules or the large molecules as in cytokines first the other way in which you modify hemodialysis to do sled is to run the blood flow at a much lower level you can run it at 150 or 200 mls per minute in comparison to the 400 mls per minute or more that you use with hemodialysis and you run the dialysate also at a low at a low flow rate to start with you might start with say 300 mls per minute of dialysate flow 150 mls of blood and 300 mls of dialysate that's roughly what most people do so essentially you slow down the blood flow slow down the dialysate flow and and take out the fluid slowly you to remove fluid like in hemodialysis you may take out 3 liters in 4 hours the same 3 liters you can extend it over a period of say 8 hours or 12 hours thereby reducing the possibility of hypovolemia and giving the body a chance giving the circulatory system a chance to fill in from the interstitial to intravascular compartment so flow rate is slower dialysis rate is slower fluid removal is also slower and run over a period over a much longer period of time say 8 to 12 hours and you do it on a daily basis depending on the circumstances and depending on the requirement of your patient there are several advantages to sled as well in terms of being able to break therapy for for possible uh, transfer of patients for say imaging ct scan if a patient needs a ct scan you may need to interrupt which is uh, quite easy to do with sled not so easy with crrt if your patient needs to undergo surgical intervention like debridement of a cellulitis or an intra abdominal surgery you can again uh, cease the sled Uh, take the patient to the theater and then resume once he comes back so it gives you a little bit of flexibility as well and most importantly in terms of cost because you are not using any replacement fluid the most important cost factor is 
in CRRT is the use of costly replacement fluid. And in SLED, you are not using any replacement fluid. So that cuts down the cost straight away. So in terms of cost, it is uh, less costly as well. So overall, you need to look at your patient, look at the hemodynamic stability, number of organs involved, and then choose the therapy that is most appropriate. And in many patients, you may be able to perform SLED and do a good job. And CRRT may not be required in many patients. I know in Australia and in the UK, because they are not used to intermittent therapies at all. So it'll be completely novel to them to do that. Nurses are very well trained on CRRT. So they wouldn't do SLED for anybody because purely because they're not trained to do so. That doesn't mean that uh, CRRT is the best for everybody. You need to be flexible. And I think uh, a flexible approach will be the most optimal approach uh, depending on your circumstances. So the same way, sir, regarding the replacement fluid, there are many uh, cheaper options like uh, using uh, perito PD peritoneal dialysis fluid or uh, the crystalloid, you add uh, some electrolytes and use that. So uh, have you tried all those uh, cheaper options and what is your opinion on that, sir? You can do. <clears throat> we used to do, <clears throat> sorry, once upon a time. Um, you can actually make up your own replacement fluid with say normal cell line electrolytes added but uh, it takes a lot of time and effort and it's not just a question of one bag you need to make several liters two liters per hour just imagine how many liters you need to make so that's not an easy thing to do and it, it becomes a, a dedicated job for fluid creation by the bedside so that is not really feasible that's the reason why we all use ready-made bags but theoretically yes it is possible to make your own Tater made custom made replacement fluid. And, that, uh, and uh, like another question is like a traumatic brain injury, a hepatic encephalopathy, especially with hemodynamic instability, will you prefer uh, CRRT over SLED? I would definitely prefer CRRT in any situation where there is a possibility of increase in cerebral edema or there is a preponderance to the formation of brain edema, like in a patient with a massive stroke, ESRD with stroke, which is a common clinical picture, or a traumatic brain injury who has uh, developed acute kidney injury. In these circumstances, if you have the choice, the preferred therapy would be CRRT because there is a definite danger there is a definite incidence of complications with hemodialysis or even SLED because of the drop, the sudden drop in osmolality that can result, which can predispose to brain edema and cause serious problems. So the preferred therapy in that instance would be CRRT if you have the choice. Yes, definitely. Uh, some people have asked about uh, scuff also, sir. Scuff is... Uh, purely fluid removal. It does not involve any dialysate. There is no diffusive clearance, nor any hemofiltration or convective clearance. You just pass blood into the filter and, and take out fluid, depending on how much fluid you need to be removed. This will be a patient, like say with cardiac failure, who's got fluid overload but the renal function itself may be preserved to some extent at least. So you don't particularly need to remove the molecules of renal failure as in urea uh, or, or any other molecule, but you would need to take out fluid. And in that situation, you may do this cuff therapy, which is slow, continuous ultrafiltration or fluid removal. Another situation may be in a patient in whom you dialyzed just a, a day ago or a few hours ago, but who still seems to be fluid overloaded. He doesn't need dialysis again. He is adequately clear. The osmolality, urea levels, they're all adequately clear. All you need to do is to take off some more fluid. So in that situation as well, you might do scuff therapy. So it is a purely fluid removing therapy without aiming for any clearance. For clearance, you need to add dialysate or you need to add replacement, which you don't do with this therapy. Isolated uh, ultrafiltration, we can do it with the hemodialysis machine as well. Like uh... you can, yes, yes, you can do. You can do. In fact, you do use uh, hemodialysis machines for that. You don't run a dialysate. Without dialysate, you use your no, you conventional hemodialysis machine and then set your fluid removal to whatever you want to. It may be 100 mils per hour, 200 mils per hour, or depending on how much you want in your patient. Temperature regulation in CRRT, sir, one question. 
I think the mission itself we can set the temperature what we want actually. Temperature is uh, you can't set in it is preset in most machines as far as uh, I understand. Um, but if you minor if you, variation we can do sir even in hemodialysis machine the minor variation we can do especially when yeah you can you can reduce the temperature to some extent some people in fact do that to reduce hemodynamic instability so that is uh, one of the options but crrt machines generally run at a fixed temperature i don't think you can change the temperature in the prisma machines we don't do that usually but hemodialysis machines as i mentioned you do especially uh, you wouldn't want to warm the fluid because it might actually cause vasodilatation and hypotension. So you might want to keep the temperature slightly low to, to prevent vasodilatation from happening. Uh, one more question, sir. That is regarding uh, disequilibrium syndrome. So yes. what about using mannitol for uh, first dialysis? Like I, I, I've seen like many uh, persons are having that practice. Yes. Yeah, this is uh, used to be done with hemodialysis that you do as the first time dialytic therapy in patients with end-stage renal failure who have very high bund levels, very high creatinine levels, very high osmolality. And if you, if you do hemodialysis in these patients and if you dramatically reduce osmolality, the problems that I mentioned can arise. And to counter that, it used to be the practice to use mannitol to try to counter this effect of the rapid lowering of osmolality you get in these circumstances, which may be quite uh, suboptimal among these patients when they undergo the first dialytic therapy. But uh, these days, most of my nephrology colleagues don't seem to use this. They confine dialysis to a short period of time and run a slow, gentle dialysis to begin with. It may be sled in many of our ICU patients to begin with as the first dialytic modality of treatment. That way you can make it gentle slower and reduce the osmolality swing quite significantly. And if you do that, you may not need to use mannitol at all. And there are other modalities also, no, sir. like you can go with a co-current flow and again, High dextrose dialysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, co-current. You can do co-current if you want to reduce clearance deliberately. You can run it instead of counter-current, which will increase clearance, like we discussed. You can use it as co-current, which will deliberately slow down your clearance. So that's also another option to reduce clearance yeah. when you don't want rapid clearance. The difference between counter-current and co-current, like Sarah has already shown in the slides. So in counter-current, the dialysate flow and the blood flow will be in the opposite direction. In co-current, that will be in the same uh, direction. 